God does not call warriors. God calls servants. God does not call warriors. God calls servants. God does not use the person you and I would choose. He uses the person you and I probably would have never choose, chosen. Sorry, chosen, 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 chosen. Hey, um, warming up, right? So uh, last time last time we were in Judges, I know it was like nine, ten weeks ago. Um, probably forgot how to spell Judges. I know I did. And so I want to make sure we remember because last time we were in Judges, I left you on a cliffhanger. We went through two parts in chapter six. We did two sermons on chapter six about this, the fact that little faith is actual true faith. And so um, I want to remind you where we have been. Here's the scene that we're given in Judges chapter six. God's people have fallen into grotesque idolatry. They have decided they have turned from God and they've turned to the things of this world. And so then we are introduced, right, like with this fact that what has happened is, is there's this guerrilla warfare going on against Israel. And so what would happen is they grow crops, they grow cattle, they grow all of this food. And when it was ripe for the picking, there's this guerrilla warfare by the Midianites. They'd come in and they'd take everything. Israel was poor, they were destitute, they were hungry, they were starving, and they cried out to God for help. And so God sends a help. And do you know how he sends help in Judges chapter 6? He sends the people a preacher. And you can hear the people as they're listening to this sermon, as this person comes up and he says, remember that our God is a redeeming God, that our God saved his people out of the hands of Egypt and that he got them across the Red Sea. Our God is a loving God. End of story, period. There is the end of the sermon. And the people, you can imagine what they're thinking, but we're still hungry. We're still destitute. And then we meet our beloved judge, Gideon. What Gideon was not doing was he was not putting on armor. He was not sharpening a sword. He was not gathering a following. Gideon was not giving some sort of obnoxious lecture. Men need to be men. Well, you know, whatever. And so here he is. And what is he doing? He's beating out wheat in a wine press. Do you know where you don't beat out wheat? in a wine press. You beat out wheat in the open. Do you know why? Because when you beat out the wheat, the chaff, the wind takes the chaff away. It separates the wheat from the chaff. And here's the fascinating thing about a wine press. A wine press is designed so that no wind would get in to keep the wine pure. So this is not the place you want to be beating out wheat. So why is he doing it? Because he is afraid. Gideon struggles with fear. And here comes God. The angel of the Lord comes and he says what to him? Oh, mighty man of valor. And you can imagine how he'd take that sarcastically, right? Oh yeah, I'm so mighty as I'm sitting here beating out wheat in a wine press. Oh yeah, I'm so valorous. I'm so strong as I'm hiding from my enemies. The Lord says, the Lord is with you. He says, oh yeah, prove it. So he goes and he makes a meal. He brings his lunch, lays the lunch on a rock, and in an instant, it's consumed by fire. And Gideon worships. And then God puts Gideon to work. Like I said, God does not call warriors. He calls servants. And so what does he do? He's told the first place you want to start, if you want to start, you got to tear down the apostasy, the false religion that has made its way into your homes. And so what is fascinating is Gideon's dad is the priest of the false religion of the Baal. And so in the cloak of darkness, Gideon takes himself and a few guys and they tear down this altar And if you don't think that's a mighty deal, let me remind you what Jesus said. A prophet is not welcome in his own town. Some of the hardest places to minister is your own family. And that's where God has, oh mighty man of valor, Gideon, start. 
So he does it over the cloak of darkness, right? He doesn't want anyone to know it is him. And of course, what is done in secret, God brings to the light. And so then the whole town comes together. They see that their altars have been destroyed and they go on a manhunt. Who has done this? And sure enough, it is easy. They narrow it down. It is Gideon and the whole town ready to lynch Gideon, ready to kill Gideon. And his father, the priest of Baal worship, stands up his apostasy starts to fade and his trust in God starts to be renewed for he's recognizing God is at work. And when that happens, the whole rest of the town start to recognize who God is. Trumpets are sounded. Israel is starting to gather for they are ready for war. But remember where Gideon started in fear. He's afraid. And so he goes to God and he asks God for a sign, just a simple sign. I'm going to lay a fleece. I'm going to lay a mat outside. If you will save Israel by my hand to make the fleece have dew on it and no dew on the rest of the ground. And so God did it. But of course, Gideon wants to be ultra sure. You and I want to be ultra sure that if I'm going to go to war, I want to be make sure I'm going to war over the right thing. So then he has God flip it. I'm going to lay out the fleece and then this time put dew on the ground, but not dew on the fleece. And overnight, God does it. Now Gideon is sure the Lord is with him. And that's where we're going to pick up our story this morning. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7 is where we're going to pick up. So now you've got this whole group, this whole army of Israel. They've all gathered. They're all here to fight with Gideon. And what we realize from the book of Judges is this great truth that you and I have a need for a Savior. That we have a need for a Savior, but we not only have a need for a Savior, we have a need for a King. Why? Because you and I, we love to make ourselves King of our own lives. Man, no one's better at things than you are, huh? And so what we do is we all do what is right in our own eyes. And that's where Israel's at. They all have done what is right in their own eyes. And when you and I do what's right in our eyes and not in the eyes of God, that is wickedness, beloved. And when we're left to our own devices, destruction follows. It's really easy sometimes when we think about the love of God to neglect the commands of God. But may I remind you, the law of God is the path to increasing joy and fellowship with God. We know this because the law is not only about rules and regulations, but the law is also about restoration. We delight in the law of the Lord. It is a grace to us. It's the avenue by which we enjoy God. And so as we think through the cycle of the judges, as we think through this fact that they were good with God, they fell into complacency, then complacency led to apostasy, apostasy led to destruction. They cried out to God. God sent them a savior. He sent them a judge. And the cycle continues. It's a whole toilet bowl that we're going to see through judges. It starts off big and gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. This you see happening even today. Clearly, God just doesn't work for me, so I'm done with God. And then discipline comes, and oh no, I need God, and then I'm good with God. I don't need God, right? Do you see this in people's lives, in your life? And here's what I'm here to tell you, beloved. Because of God's great love, he will not allow his people to walk into this kind of ideology. He will not allow you or I to squander our lives this way. He will send us discipline. Why? Because God disciplines those whom he loves. And we're going to see how God is going to discipline not only Israel and how he's going to save them out of their discipline, but how he disciplines even Gideon today. And so um, we've got a lot to go over. Um, We've got a whole chapter. I'm going to get through a whole chapter this morning. I promise I don't have a lot of time to do it. So let's pray and let's get to work this morning. Father God, You sent your son, the true and better Adam, to be the propitiation for our sins, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And God, we thank you that you did what we could not do, weakened by the flesh. And so God, we ask for your help this morning as we open up your word. That fear is a real and true thing that we all struggle with. 
And God, let us see your graciousness in the midst of our failures and our fears this morning. Now, beloved, I ask that you pray for me. Pray that I'll be helpful to you this morning. Pray that God will humble me behind and beneath his cross this morning. Now, loved ones, I ask that you pray for yourself. Pray that God open up your ears, your heart, your mind, and you'll respond to him accordingly this morning. Father God, this time is yours. We ask for your help now. We pray these things because of your son's atoning work on the cross, whose spirit is alive and active within all who believe. Amen. Judges chapter 7, starting in verse 1, verses 1 through 8. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midians into their hand. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand was saving me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone whom I say, This one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps, with, laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the other men go to his own home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. One of the things you will know about Scripture and in life is that life is full of both hills and valleys, both mountaintop experience and dreadful valleys. The Bible promises you, you will have a mighty mountaintop but you will also have valley. And we know this from Psalm 23, the Lord who leads us through the highest of highs also brings us not only through the lowest of lows, but listen, he brings us to the lowest of lows. The same God who brought you to the mountain is the same God who brings you to the valley and then not only brings you to it, but brings you through it. So here we have Gideon. He's got 32,000 men. Uh, that's a lot of people, right? If you go to like kind of like the U of A basketball game, right? That's about 30,000 people. That's his army he's dealing with. And all of them ready to fight, ready to put the Midians away. And God has a message for Gideon. You have too many with you. Now, that's something fascinating because this isn't some sort of like clandestine mission that you need like, you know, SEAL Team 6 to go through in, in, in battle, right? This is a war of numbers. These wars are won with numbers. And here's what God is saying. You have too many with you. Why? Because I don't want anyone to say, I got the victory. Do you know why? Because that's your tendency and my tendency in life. When success comes, sure, we might sprinkle, well, God did this for me, but inside we're secretly so happy that people are praising our victories. You and I can so easily take praise for ourselves because it feels good. Yet God will not allow this for your life and my life because it's destructive. Alone to him be the praise. So what will God do in our self-exaltation? He will humble us. Remember, um, God exalts the self-humbled or he humbles the self-exalted. Without humility, we will never see the greatness of God. Beloved, a Christian cannot be a Christian without humility. Because without humility, you will start to praise yourselves, praise your own works, praise your own victories, and you'll become a worshiper of self. Welcome to 2023 America. 
man, we love us. When you and I are in need, when we have weakness, we plead for what? Mercy and grace. And God is the only true giver of grace, only the true giver of mercy and the grace that we need. The problem is, is people try to use God in their moments of weakness, in their moments of destruction. I need God, and then things get back to good, and then I no longer need God. But for the Christian, loved ones, hear me on this. It is a constant and consistent looking to Christ for all of our satisfaction. Humility will always, let me say that again, humility will always lead to praise. Humility teaches us to trust in God even when things are not the way you and I would have done things. And let me tell you, if things would have gone the way you and I would have planned, we for sure would be in a lot of trouble. But praise be to God who knows us and knows what we need better than even we do. And so what God is doing here is he is humbling his servant. Because he wants Gideon to understand. He wants you to understand. He wants myself to understand this this morning. Victory comes not from our brilliance, not from our hard work, not from our ingenuity, but from the Lord. And you and I might be tempted to think, why is God making a big deal about this? Let's go kill the Midians. Let's go get their food back. Let's do all of this. And the answer I want to tell you is found in Isaiah 42, verse 8, where God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. Listen to me. My glory I will not share with another. Ain't happening, bro. And that includes you. And so, loved one, let me tell you, God's not going to compete with you for praise. He wins every day. Next, we see that they have good numbers. God gets rid of their numbers, but they also have what? A tactical advantage. They're sitting where? On top of the mountain. The Midianites are below. And when you and I, when we see great victory, we can see that there are some times when we say, to God be the glory, we sprinkle that in, but after time, to God be the glory starts to fade, and we start to talk about our ingenuity, our thoughts, our hard work. I did this, I did that. And God wants his people to say, to God alone be the victory. Beloved, God will do this in your life. He will bring you to moments to where the only explanation is that God has done the victory. And you know this to be true. Some of the worst times of your life were also some of the sweetest times with God. Amen? Anyone? Yeah? You know this to be true. This is God's doing. Do you know why? Because he told you, I'm not going to share my glory with you. Come praise me. And so I love this. I love this fact. You know why? Because remember, Gideon gave God two tests with the two fleeces. That sounded great, man. I want, all right, God, I'm going to test you. But now look, God has now given Gideon what? Two tests. I'm going to get rid of your army. 70%. First one, gone. And then he's going to get rid of all but 1% of who he had. So Gideon releases 70% of the men who are afraid and terrified. Remember where we found Gideon? What was he? He was afraid and terrified. I always wondered if Gideon was like, you know, I think I might want to join those guys. You see, Gideon is being forced to separate himself from the fearful. And so let's talk about fear for just a moment. Fear is a real and true experience for us all, is it not? To say, I do not fear, is a lie. If the Bible commands over 300 times, do not fear. That's a lot of times, loved ones. Then it is something that every single person in this room has a struggle with. We all have fears and trepidations. The problem is, you and I, we tend to minimize, excuse, and protect our fears, and yet tell others, don't fear that. You have no need to fear that. And we put our holy language around that. To make matters difficult, when you go to Revelation chapter 21, you read that what? The cowardly will be thrown into the lake of fire. So I read that and I was like, well, great. Now I'm afraid of being cowardly. I want to talk about fears, right? Like that, they come up. 
And so God has a great answer for us that all struggle in our fears. Whatever fear you're walking through this morning, here's how we are to destroy our fear. You ready for this? Fear the Lord. Know how God destroys your fear? He tells you to fear Him. You'll read throughout all of Scripture this fear the Lord language. Fear the Lord works two ways. It draws us closer to God and it keeps us from running to Him. We fear God, not man. The fear of the Lord keeps us from fearing man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. Psalm 147, 11. Can I share this with you, loved ones? Fearfulness is not a once for all conquered, but a, some, uh, but a sin that must be resisted again and again, put to death over and over. Each and every day, you and I must say, I'm going to put to death my fear of man in this world so I can fear the Lord. And this is the greatest truth of fear the Lord. Paul says in Galatians 1, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. In your fear, you have one question. Do I fear man or do I fear God? And when you fear God, then and only then can you see the goodness of who God is. The fear of God assuages our fear of man. The fear of the Lord empowers us. It emboldens us in this life. So something amazing is going on in Gideon's life. And you must recognize this is God's doing. 22,000 men gone because of their fear. Great, I'll roll with 10,000. But no, what does he do? He sends away 10,000 more. Um, You can read all the commentators, all their opinions on this. But I think it's all pretty obvious. God wants this number to get down to a very small, inconsequential number. And I want you to notice something in chapter 7 that's so amazing. For those of you that think a lot about fear, I want you to notice something. Nowhere does God bring the hammer down on the people who are afraid. He doesn't do it to Gideon, and he doesn't do it to the 22,000 men that walk away. He doesn't come up and say, good, you're better off without those knuckleheads. He doesn't do any of that. No, he's graceful. He walks alongside them. Because why? He's the one that will destroy their fears. Beloved, do not minimize another believer's fears. This is just, this is the Phariseeism that's kind of in us all that's got to be put to death. When you talk to another Christian and they share with you their real fears, which are real fears, it's so easy for us to put on our, our little Pharisee hat You know, get all holy and say, no need to fear that. Here's what you do. Maybe someone's fearful about money in the future. Tell them what the Word of God says. Quote Jesus to them. Look at the birds of the sky. Do you see how your Heavenly Father feeds them? Aren't you more than they? Man, maybe you got someone that, man, they just really fear death. Would you quote to them what Jesus said? Don't fear him who could destroy the body. Rather, fear him who could destroy the body and the soul. Fear a life that has never truly lived for the glory of life, uh, the glory of God. Fear a life of wasting your time in front of a TV screen rather than seeking the glory and the majesty of God. And beloved, fear is a major part of our culture. Do you know why? Because fear sells. Any commercials about pretty much what? Either make your life better or you got to get this item and this will help this terrible fear that's going to come. And so fear is a real deal. Fear sells. But when we fear the Lord, we can say that as Paul did in Philippians 4. I know the secret. I know how I can not be afraid as I sit in this jail cell waiting for my execution, waiting for me to be killed. I know how I don't fear because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The fear of the Lord, the love of the Lord empowers and boldens the believer courageously to put to death the fear of the things of this world. 22,000, gone. 10,000 left in this weird, strange test of, you know, a dog lapping with the water. You all know what exactly I'm talking about. Okay, I'm on a clock, got to keep going. So, all right, and so now we're down to 1% of what he was left with. 300 mighty men. 
And I want us to know this, an impossible situation. And look at what God does. He promises Gideon, I will save you. I will give the Midianites into your hand. And then look at verse 8 with me. This is so important. Gideon has 300 men and a promise of God. And look at the text. In verse 8, at the end of verse 8, it says, And the camp of Midian was what? Below him in the valley. Here you have Gideon. There's the 300 men. They're encamped behind him. He's at the edge of this cliff. The Midianites are below him. He's alone with the promise of God. Beloved, we live in this life in the promises of future grace of God. God working all things together for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. After all, who can bring a charge against God's elect? What court of this world can hold you? It's God who justifies. If God has given us Christ, he has given us all things. I bet you Gideon felt so alone. And in even the loneliest of moments, you can know that God is there for you because he has made promises to you. And God is faithful to fulfill all that he has promised. We find our yes and amen in him. Verse 9 through 18. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterwards, your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number, as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley, bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and the camp and the tent, and struck it, so it fell and turned it upside down, so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. God has given it into his hand the Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. I love that. Highlight that. Underline it. Circle it. Star it. I mean, put fireworks around that. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And divide up the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into their hands, all of them, and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpets, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. If you remember back in chapter 6, Gideon asked for a sign and God gave one. Here in chapter 7, in Gideon's lowest of times, he doesn't even ask for a sign. God just gives. And I want you to know this beautiful truth about God. God gives to Gideon exactly what he needs. Beloved ones, listen to me. God gives you exactly what you need. He is a good father and a good father gives good gifts. All that he has given you, and I say all, we're reading through Job, you know this, all that he has given you is for your good, for the praise and the glory of his name. Gideon has given a great grace. He was alone and he was afraid. And God answers those two issues. First with his aloneness. We've been reading through Job, you all know this. You all have been suffering well, suffering through Job, as it were. And do you notice something we talked about a long time, probably longer than I need to in our home group last week, that Job said that one of his greatest struggles right now was his friends? He is in incredible pain, incredible suffering, and he says what? You, my friends, are the biggest pain of them all. I always wondered what would happen if Job's friends would have just kept their mouth shut and hung out with Job. It would have been a lot shorter book, I imagine. But you and I do this, don't you? We have to explain away everything. We have to solve the unsolvable problems. 
rather than doing what Purah does here, just walk with him. Just be a friend to him. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all time and a brother is born for adversity. God is with Gideon, no question, but God in his great love sends Purah to him. This truth. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to need a Purah, but there's going to be times in your life when you're going to need to be a Purah. You're going to need to walk alongside someone. And listen, you don't have to have some sort of magic plan or anything. Let me tell you, coffee for the super sanctified people does just great. Sit with them. Enjoy a meal together. Be with them. There's no seminary class about what to say when people are suffering. Do you know why? Because it's just not there. We can be great friends to one another. A friend is one who protects. A friend is one who defends. A friend is one who loves even when it's hard. Gideon is alone and God sends a friend. And then next, how does he answer his fear? How does he deal with his fear? Same way he deals with your fear and my fear. He commands and he promises. He commands and he promises. Go down, take your servant, listen to your enemies. And then, so those are your three commands. And then here's your one promise. And your hands will be strengthened. Gee whiz, I got to go. All right, so three commands and one promise. And let me show you, you will see this all throughout scripture, that God tightly connects his commands and his promises. God's commandments are often the vehicles in which he brings about his promise. And this is the great truth about God. What God commands, he completes. What God commands, he gives you the power in order to fulfill. God commanded Gideon because why? God wanted to strengthen Gideon. God commands not because he wanted to make Gideon upset, not because he wanted to mess up his style, but because of his great love for Gideon. All of the commands given to us, Christian, are for your good, for your joy of knowing and savoring and seeing God. Don't discount the commands of God. So, they had 300 versus a countless, and now it's down to two versus a countless as they go down. The Midianites have camels. Gideon has none. This seems like an unfair fight. And I know this because this is a struggle for some of you, probably a lot of you, if you've been paying attention. It seems like we as a church are in an unfair world. The world has much more money than we do, much more people institutions, power on power of this world, news organizations with teams and teams of people with camera, and we've got like two back there. But remember what God said, so that he gets the victory, not us. We're outmatched, we're outgunned, but here is the good news. It is God's victory to be won. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over this present, present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil, those are our enemies. And because of the cross, because of the mighty hand of God that has saved us, God has rendered hell and all of its dominion as powerless. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And I want you to notice, so here you have Gideon and Purah. They go down just at the right time to the right people. And again, countless amount of people. You got to think about the right time where they overhear someone talking about their dream to the right place. And what happens? They're giving this dream. And do you notice something? That the enemies of God are more sure of the victory of God than Gideon. Oh, I know what's going on. That just means God's going to win. And this strengthens Gideon's hands. When you come into contact with the power of God, it's humbling and it's convicting. So how does Gideon respond? He worships. I love how Seth just pointed us to that great fact last week. Sing. 
Sing a victory. Sing praises. Worship is important because worship reminds us that you and I, our battle is not fighting for victory, but fighting from victory. I want to say that again. The battle you and I are engaged in is we are not fighting for victory, but from victory. Jesus on the cross said what? It is finished. Which means what? You're either fighting from victory or Jesus is a liar. So when you're wrestling, when you're putting to death certain sin in your life, I can tell you this, loved ones, the only conquered sin is forgiven sin. Fight sin with the knowledge that your fight is not for victory over your sin, but your fight is from victory that was won not by you, but by Christ on your behalf. And when you and I are tempted to think that we're losing this battle, Let us be reminded that Jesus paid it, and he paid it all, and he paid it in full. And when you and I understand that, it has shattering effects for the rest of the world. So then Gideon, he goes back up the mountain, he calls his army to arms. And look at what he does. Do you notice he doesn't say grab swords, shields, bows, armor? No, trumpets, pottery, torches. Um, in case you aren't in that kind of war area, military area, um, any military person in here will tell you, those are not what you want to bring into battle. Not much help. But those tools are not the tools of battle, but the tools of victory. And then he says this. He grabs him. He says, the Lord has given the host of Midian into what? Your hand. Do you remember God's promise to Gideon? I have given the Midianites into your hand. First masculine singular Gideon. And now he's telling telling his people, the Lord has given victory into your second masculine plural. Y'all's hand. And he says, look at me and do as I do. Sounds a lot like what Paul told the church of Corinth. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Sounds like the writer of Hebrews. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome, the way of their faith, and imitate their faith. Loved ones, the only thing God requires is a humble and contrite heart. And when that happens, people will follow. When that happens, people will see the work, the grace of God. Because the Christian life is contagious. Second Corinthians chapter 2. But thanks to be to God who in Christ always, always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. And among those who are perishing, the one of fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life, life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's words, but men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of God. We speak in Christ. If you're struggling leading others to Christ, can I remind you, your first responsibility is to be a follower of Christ. God will call those others to arms to follow. You follow Christ. And here's what happens. The people trust Gideon. No one grabs a sword. No one grabs a bow. No one grabs armor. They say, we see God's at work within you, Gideon. And we will follow. They trust in the plan of Gideon because they trust in the one who is leading Gideon. That's God. Remember, Israel thought God had abandoned them. They thought God had taken off. They didn't realize it was them who apostated from God. And so Gideon, our fearful leader, calls people to the purposes of God. Therefore, beloved, in your fear, you say one thing and one thing only. Here I am, God. Send me. 
because I fear you, O Lord, a whole lot more than I fear anything in this world. 19 through 25. So Gideon and the hundred and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch. And when they had just set the watch, they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beit Shittoth toward Zerah, as far as the borders of Abel Meloa by Tabith. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers all through the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beit Barath and as far as the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they captured the waters as far as Beit Barath and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. This is not a battle, but a victory. 300 verses countless. And you might be here thinking, well, that's good for Gideon, but what about for me? I want to read to you one of my favorites, Psalm 147, 10 through 11. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor, in the pleasure in the, nor is his pleasure in the legs of man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. You might be thinking, how can we get the victory? We don't even have the best weapons. Forget that. We don't have any weapons. Think about how Christ tells the church, go make disciples of all nations. You're going to topple kingdoms. Destroy strongholds. And all you and I have armed with is thus says the Lord. And that's all we need. That's all we got to tell people. This is what God has said. Why? Because it's not your victory to win. He's already won it. We just worship and celebrate the victory that's been won. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of the divine power to destroy strongholds. Do you notice the sword for Gideon and what? Gideon nor any of his 300 men, none of them have a what? Sword. Do you know why? Because it's God's sword. And this is the gospel, beloved. God set our own sword against ourselves. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live according to not me, but to the Spirit of God. Do you know how God gets the victory in your life and my life? He kills us so he can make us new. Are you dead this morning and alive in Christ? Then you have a lot to celebrate in victory. If not, can I call you to surrender? Give up your life to Jesus. And enjoy sweet victory. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you.